the British Prime Minister is still battling to retain her position. I feel like we're repeating ourselves every week on this. <laughs> yeah, doesn't matter who the Prime she Minister is. She's ever not battling to retain battling. her position, yeah. unfortunately. Um, shouts of resign could be heard as she spoke uh, today in the House of Parliament. Uh, it's been it's been a difficult time for our colleagues across the water. Uh, we are joined now by um, Investigations Editor with Global, Lewis Goodall, also a third of uh, the news agents. Hi, Lewis. How are you? I'm not bad, thank you. How are you? With deepest sympathies to you and your colleagues. It's been a very hectic couple of weeks. How are you coping with it? Oh, sympathies. Come on. You know, we're all journalists here. Like, I mean, you know, this like, is, this jealous, is what yeah. I don't know how it... I don't know how it... I don't know. I mean, how... Yeah. I mean, how is the, the Martin Varadka handover going? Do you know what I mean? Like, I mean, um, by, by comparison... I mean, again, the great thing about Ireland, right, is that at least you can kind of, you're close enough to it that it can all feel really kind of connected and sometimes a little bit too connected, right? Um, but you can kind of live vicariously. You can still sort of say, oh, well, that's happening over there. Yeah. Um, so it's, look, I mean, like it's hour, it's hour by hour, um, as always with this stuff. Um, and, you know, you never quite know what is going to happen next. I mean, basically, you know, the Conservative Party is very good, uh, has been very good now at inflicting its psychodrama on the rest of politics. Um, and, you know, I, I think we were just like a bit like the, the, the frog in the boiling jar now. We've just got so used to it. Uh, becoming sort of crazier, crazier by hour by hour. But, you know, you, I don't know what we'd quite do now if things went back to normal, if there is such a thing. Well, it is exciting. How, tell us, in a, a brief synopsis, how has it come to this point, Lewis, for our listeners? How long you got? I, I, I mean, we've got I a 15 minute window. window. Well, keep it tight, keep it tight. <laughs> in how's summary. Kind of, okay, right. Let's go back to the Maastricht Treaty of 1990. <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, I don't know. I mean, look, I mean, look, the, the, the situation as it is now, what, well, about three o'clock on Wednesday afternoon, you know, Truss has done Prime Minister's questions. It was a pretty bad performance. It was probably worse, even worse than most people expected, which is kind of, uh, wow. you know, is it, kind of difficult to achieve in these, uh, in, these, mm. in these circumstances. But it's very difficult for her. What could she say? You know, I mean, like, number 10 have alighted upon this line of, well, I'm, uh, you know, I took, I had a courageous decision. You know, I, it was very difficult for me to turn back on everything I said, I believe, but I realized that was the right thing, and that's what I've done. I mean, and that is really small beer, right? Because basically the argument is is like tantamount to, yeah, I went and set the house on fire. I was an arsonist, uh, and I let all of the contents of the house, all the furniture and everything inside it burn to a crisp. But, you know, after three weeks, I did go and get a hose and pull it out. And that did take real courage because I'd put it on fire <laughs> in the first place. You know, that really, it doesn't cut much mustard. Do you know what I mean? It's a difficult argument to sustain. So it's difficult to know what she can say. And, you know, the truth is, is that, you know, Conservative MPs are, we're playing that game again of, you know, how many letters have been sent to Sir Graham Brady, who basically spends his entire life having letters handed to him by his <laughs> colleagues, um, calling him no confidence. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what he would do. He's probably the busiest 1922 committee chairman there's ever been, um, you know, and we're playing that game all over again. And he's basically said that if he gets to a third, or it's been, he's let it be known that if it gets to a third of his colleagues say have uh, sent him a letter, then he'll go and see the Prime Minister. So we're just playing that numbers game all over again. Um, so we're in a situation now where a lot of the stuff that she announced as part of a mini budget three weeks ago, or at least the quasi quarting announced, but that she kind of co-wrote, all of that's been thrown out and he's been sacked for doing something that she agreed with. Um, is it a situation where it, it is effectively, it's lose-lose for her, that either she stays on, but that she's kind of got no authority, that she's got no real manifesto to speak of, that she's a Prime Minister in name only, or that they just decide to turf her out and put in someone who's got a bit more authority. There doesn't seem to be any way at all that she can salvage any kind of kudos or credibility out of this. Well, look, I think that uh, you've got to try and understand the psychology of what's going through her head and her team's head, right? The truth is, is that they're not really thinking long, long term, right? I mean, you know, there's a suggestion that maybe there's a very, very slender path that she can restore stability and, you know, start to project confidence, whatever that means, and get through to October the 31st when there's the midterm budget review and then get beyond that and then get to Christmas and then get beyond Christmas, that somehow she can sort of salvage the situation. The truth is they're thinking literally hour by hour and day by day. And what is the main thing going through her head? Like, why is she thinking I have to try and salvage this? Well, fundamentally, it's not really about the ideas at this point because you know, it's been made very clear that her entire perspective has been junked. You know, Britain's still got the uh, crosshair, it's still in the crosshairs of the market. So the, it's room for manoeuvre is very limited. What Liz Truss is basically playing for now 
is not to be a pub quiz quiz question, not to mm. be a bit of trivia, an asterisk next to her name, the prime minister who lasted for two months and set her own premiership on fire because she's got to live with that for the rest of her life, right? She's not even 50. She would be facing down the prospect of every time she goes into the supermarket being sort of loathed because she's the woman who literally cost everybody more in their mortgages and, you know, a mixture of loathing and and mocking. And, you know, that's a very difficult thing for any politician to swallow. So she's just trying to think, can I get to November? Can I get to December? Can I get to 2023? So the numbers next to my name are at least 2022 to 2023 rather than being 2022. It's as base as that, I think. That's what we're dealing with in terms of psychology. What what does it do to the national psyche, Lewis, when you have, you know, such a, a, a fundamental economic policy decided by a British prime minister and her chancellor effectively upended and, and binned, scrapped because of the international markets? The fact that the markets can decide then what the policy of, of, of the British government is has to have some damage on how the country sees itself. I think this is an economic series, you know, for Britain. Um, I think we get very wrapped up partly because we've all gone through the sort of Conservative Party psychodrama over the last few years. And, you know, obviously, we get very worked up in the personalities, what this means for trust, what, you know, actually, let's just divorce and forget about that. What has happened over the last few uh, days and weeks has been a deeply revealing moment for British economic power. Um, And if you take a slightly longer view, going back to the start of the Brexit period and so on, there has no doubt been a very visible real terms decline in both British political power, but also economic power as well. Um, And it has been a moment where fundamentally, like Suez, it was a moment of hubris. You have a government come along and say, actually, it doesn't really, Britain has the ability and the strength and the power to uh, buck the market, go against the market, um, and the market will keep lending to us. And we saw in real terms, real time, that that wasn't true. We, she tried to do Reaganomics without having the dollar as uh, in her back pocket as a reserve currency, and it didn't work. And I think over the long term, there's two effects of that. One, whatever British politics has actually just become a lot narrower in the last few days and weeks. The menu available to any British government, whether that's you know Liz Truss or someone from the Conservative Party or who replaces her, or even an incoming Labour government, is going to be that much more restricted. Ireland knows about that. Ireland knows what it's like to have the markets Mm. suddenly have you in their crosshairs Mm. and what a debilitating effect that has on politics because basically it means that the menu of options available to a government is so much more limited than what it was before. So politics has become much narrower and I think that's in the short term and medium term and in the long term, I think there's no doubt it's been a humiliating moment for Britain akin to 1976 and the IMF crisis or 1992 and Black Wednesday and that will have an effect both on the psychology of the country but also of the political class. And when you look at that then, Lewis, on a kind of a ground level, when you look at towns and villages and cities up and down the United Kingdom and, and people who are paying their bills and getting on with their lives, what do you hear from them? How are they feeling about all of this? Well, look, I mean, we've just had a situation where um, uh, 10%, you know, we've just had inflation, latest inflation figures out, 10% uh, higher than everybody thought it was going to be. It's still hovering about that. And, and that's the extraordinary thing. We spent the entire summer basically, as the Conservative Party has its very long leadership contest, speculating and talking about, well, what is the British government's reaction or response going to be to help the public through what is a profound and significant cost of living crisis? Well, we now know what the reaction is going to be, what the response is going to be. And it's a response that no one would have anticipated. It is a, you know enormous package of tax cuts which precipitates a financial crisis of international proportions, which then precipitates... Uh, all, not only all of the tax cuts going that were promised to help with cost of living, but also chaos in the mortgage markets, which has added to the inflationary problem. And so the British public end up in the worst of all worlds, where not only has there been a crisis in the mortgage markets and interest rates are going to be higher than they would have been, and mortgage costs are going to be higher than they would have been, but we don't even have the tax cuts to cushion the blow. And the British government, which is suddenly denuded of a lot of the policy options and freedom of manoeuvre that it might have had to try and help everybody. So, you know, the British government is going to be pretty unique in Europe now in essentially its government not be really being able to assist its citizens that much through the autumn and winter. It will a bit around energy, but not as much as thought at precisely the time when and on top of that it's probably going to have to raise, not cut taxes, and cut public spending at precisely the time when many other European governments are coming out with a package of support measures for their populations. It is just, 
an unfathomable situation by comparison to even a few weeks ago. Mm. There's one thing which I think has caught people's attention here in particular are, is, is comedy really about this. Uh, Michael Spicer, I'm sure you saw the video uh, where he was sort of imitating a journalist getting texts in from, from Tory MPs about Liz Truss. We I actually know. have a clip of that here which we can insert there for our viewers. And, and, and not long before we came on air, an ex-cabinet minister said to me, watching Liz Truss lead my party is like watching a sea lion driving a Segway into a bear trap factory. She has the aptitude and charisma of a crisp packet in a high wind and I want her chased out of Downing Street by wolves. I mean, that's that's just an example. So Lewis, in reality... I feel seen. I feel yeah. seen. I was, <laughs> was going to ask you, like, I mean, this has been something which I've noticed even with Theresa May and with Boris Johnson as well, is that when there's a Tory leader in trouble, you have MPs swarming to have their their spake, as we'd say over here, about oh, the leader and just basically doing it in as flowery language as possible secretly. Like, what, what are they saying to you? What, what is it about them? Do they think that they're going to get these comments broadcast and there's almost a competitive nature to it or is it a bit of grandstanding? What is it? Honestly, it is ridiculous. I mean, it's actually, I think, one of the worst parts of like the kind of Westminster village. It, it's it's like, it's. I think both sides are basically egging the other on, right? The journalists are, ba are saying to the Tory MPs, so what's going on? And oh, how bad, how, how, how bad, how bad is it? And they go, oh, it's very bad. Oh, go on, tell me a bit more, how bad? And you know, and there's a kind of like competitive element and it ends up just becoming absurd. It becomes like, it descends into kind of the, I, as far as I'm concerned, I want to see her like literally fired out of a cannon. And then I want to see her entrails be picked to bits <laughs> by the ravens of the Tower of London. Yeah, yeah. Or it becomes, you know, you start to get these absurd historical references. This is, this is worse than Talleyrand, you know, and all this sort of like, it just becomes absolutely absurd. Most of it is completely unknowable to the average viewer, listener or reader or whatever. They just think this is absurd, but it just becomes part of the kind of pantomime of the of the Westminster discourse. Uh, sometimes it does feel like we wish they'd put as much thought into their choice of leader as they do into their wordplay. Um, <laughs> we've been spitballing before in this podcast, Lewis, about whether it's plausible or whether the Tories could really pull off changing leader twice in quick succession mm. without kind of getting any public sign off or sort of going back and checking with the public that they're still on board. And we've sort of reached a conclusion that it's not really plausible or tenable to do that. But I suppose <laughs> we're in a situation now where mm. they probably would try to do that, that they would get rid of Liz Truss and bring in someone else and just not bother to consult the public because consulting the public is, is a suicide wish, isn't it? Well, look, uh, there've been lots of like, there've been lots of things over the last few years that people never thought could be possible, but ended up being possible. One of which, to be honest, was Liz Truss becoming prime minister. I think if you'd said that, you know, only a couple of years ago or six months ago, well, maybe not six months ago, but 12 months ago. So people would have found that an unlikely prospect, right? So I think in the grand scheme of things, given all of the precedents that have been felled and all of the sort of various things that were never ever, could never ever happen that have happened, I think, you know, the Contori party changing PM again in the middle of a parliament, so having three PMs in a year or three PMs in a parliament isn't probably the most extreme example of that. And the fact of the matter is, A, there is actually, although I think you know the public would probably find it, would be incredulous at it, and there would be growing questions around legitimacy for the government, particularly if it was doing more and more things that weren't in the 2019 general election manifesto, which it would be doing because of the crisis in the markets and cuts in public spending and so on. But nonetheless, there's no constitutional requirement to have a general election as long as they can command the support of the House of Commons. And I think, you know, if the Tory, Tory MPs are basically weighing up different size catastrophes, right? They're, they're not weighing up good options. They're just weighing up the least bad. And if the choice is between Liz Truss going into the next general election as their leader, which literally very, almost no Conservative MPs want gone Liz Truss and her in a Praetorian guard, right? Because the thing you've got to remember about her is that she doesn't have, unlike, say, Boris Johnson, who still has a lot of support on the back benches of the Tory party, and lots of Tory MPs would love to see him back. They, she doesn't really have a particular constituency within the Conservative Party. She doesn't have a phalanx of her own, really. It was the sort of the Boris Johnson phalanx that sort of swept in behind her, but it's pretty skin deep in terms of their support for her. So, you know, ultimately, the Conservative Party is just weighing up what is the least worst option. And if that were a choice of just, yeah, okay, you're going to have a lot of members of the public going, this is illegitimate, we want a general election. Well, frankly, you just sort of grin and bear it and go, okay, well, it's mm. not going to happen. And just try hope that you've got two years 
to, you know, to, to grin and bear it and see what happens. Mm. One group of people who didn't expect ever to see Liz Truss and didn't want to see Liz Truss ever become the Prime Minister is actually the Irish government. Uh, there was a lot of briefing around the time of the leadership competition yeah. Yeah. that, well, we, we don't mind who it is as long as it isn't Liz Truss uh, because she was seen as a Brexit convert. And there's that old saying about never trust a turncoat because they have too much to prove. Mm. Um, Mm-hmm. What do we think about it? I mean, this is obviously a very Irish-led question, but there was a, a thought, I think even people like Michelle Barnier expressed it, that because of the economic upheaval now in Britain, they wouldn't want to have too much of a confrontation with Europe about the Northern Ireland Protocol, for example. So they thought that there might be a lot more space then for a compromise. Has that entered into any thought process there? Is there any likelihood then of that there will be more of a chance of some sort of bridge building with Europe than there would have been otherwise if there wasn't for this you know, economic uh, shitstorm, I'm going to say, actually, <laughs> well, you know what's sad uh, about this, which is I don't think it's really entering much of their equation or thinking one way or the other, in the sense that this is kind of what happens, right? And we're, we've been so accustomed to it now for a year. We basically haven't had a government in Britain that's not been enveloped in crisis basically all year, because since the start of the year, you had party gate, seems like a long time ago now, whatever, and that just sort of ran and ran and ran. And then you went straight headfirst into all of this as soon as that ended. And I think the truth is, is that when you have a government which is just in perpetual crisis, everything else goes out the window. And like I said before, everything basically just becomes about hour by hour, day by day survival, staying alive to the next day. And in terms of whether what they're really thinking about, say, the Northern Ireland Protocol, obviously really important, at the very top of government, there mm-hmm. just will be no bandwidth to really discuss it. I think, you know, as long as the PM remains weak, it's certainly, and the economy is in a very poor state, it's unlikely that they're going to decide to say, hey, let's just, you know, let's have a trade war with the EU in those <laughs> circumstances. But, you know, I don't even really think it's entering their bandwidth and thinking very much one way or the other. Lewis Goodall, Investigations Editor with Global. Thank you so much for joining us on the Group Chat Podcast. It's fair to say if you enjoy the Group Chat, you're definitely going to enjoy the news agents. Um, So make sure you check it out wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks, Lewis. My pleasure.